Hey, quick impression for you. Guess who I am? Hello, I just made my first appearance. Oops, I'm captured. Oh, I'm free again. Oops, I'm captured again. I'm dead. I'm alive, and I'm a ninja. I'm dead. Who am I? Did you guess Firefly? Well, you saw the thumbnail and the title of the video. You cheated. Hello everybody, Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here. This is the show where we review every vintage G.I. Joe toy from 1982 to 1994. After lingering in the 90s for a while, it's time for us to get back to the good old-fashioned red-blooded 80s G.I. Joe. This is a redo of an old video. I have reviewed Firefly before, but that was a very old video and it should be redone. Firefly was a boring character in the 80s. The figure was promising, but very little was done with him. He was mostly forgotten until he was re-released in the 90s. Then he wasn't boring at all. He was interesting in all the worst ways. Is Firefly a mysterious saboteur or a non-mysterious brightly colored ninja? Yes, the answer is yes. Let's take a look at the character that 80s G.I. Joe fans and 90s G.I. Joe fans remember very differently. HCC 788 presents Firefly. This is Firefly, Cobra's saboteur from 1984. This figure was introduced in 1984 and was also available in 1985. It was discontinued for 1986. It was designed by Ron Rudat for Hasbro. There were two other versions of Firefly released in the vintage era. Version 2 was released in 1992 and version 3 was released in 1993. I've already reviewed those figures. In the 90s, Firefly was transformed into a ninja, but oddly the figures were were not released in the Ninja Force line. Prototype names for Firefly included Monkey Wrench and Sapper. The name Sapper may have been a bit on the nose, since part of the job of a Sapper is breaching fortifications and demolitions, and that is Firefly's specialty. The name Monkey Wrench was later used for a Dreadnought. A Firefly is a flying insect with a bioluminescent body. As a child, we called them lightning bugs. Sometimes we would catch them and put them in a jar and watch them glow. On television, there was a cartoon character called Louis the Lightning Bug who taught electricity safety. Why is the Cobra Saboteur called Firefly? Probably just because it sounds cool. It's also similar to Firebug, which is old slang for an arsonist. Firefly was released in 1984, which was a great year for Cobra. There were numerous memorable Cobra characters introduced in that year. The Baroness, Storm Shadow, Zartan, all very memorable named Cobra characters. Probably the least memorable Cobra from 1984 was the Stinger Driver, but he was not a named Cobra, he was just a trooper. There is a variation on Firefly, but not one I would seek out. Some figures have black eyes and some have brown eyes. I have a modern Firefly figure, so let's take a look at him. This is Firefly version 14 from 2007. This is a fully modern G.I. Joe action figure. A lot of the details from the original figure are copied over to this modern figure. The gray uniform is lighter, but it gets the same idea across. For accessories, he has a black submachine gun. It is not like the green submachine gun on the original, but it does have a folding stock, so you can fold that out. That is nice. My problem with this accessory is that I cannot get the figure's hand on the grip, which is why I have him holding it by the magazine. He has a walkie-talkie just like the original, this time in black plastic instead of green, and on his right leg, in the holster, he has a removable pistol. It's a really tight fit, but you can take it out of the holster. He has a backpack, much like the version one figure, and like the version 1 figure, the back panel is removable to show some tools inside. His final accessory is his figure stand, which says codename Firefly. I'm not a big fan of this modern Firefly figure. The lighter camouflage is okay, but I much prefer the darker gray. Also, that submachine gun really bothers me. It should fit into the hand much easier than it does. Let's take a look at Firefly's accessories, and let's start with his submachine gun. This is a green submachine gun. It has a magazine magazine and a vented shroud over the barrel. It has a long stock with a curved butt to fit the contour of the arm. There have been a couple releases of this submachine gun in different colors in Battle Gear accessory packs. There is also a variation of this submachine gun in lighter green plastic, but I have not found that variation, so this is the only one I have to show you. This may be loosely based on the Smith & Wesson M76, but I'm not 
certain about that. It may also be based on a Russian submachine gun, the PP-91 KEDR. It doesn't look exactly like either of those real-world weapons. Pre-production artwork shows Firefly holding a submachine gun that is very clearly close to the MAT-49. The final production accessory was significantly different from that. Firefly's next accessory is the most infamous. It is his walkie-talkie. He includes a tiny walkie-talkie with an antenna, a very thin antenna that would be easy to break off. I do not place this in the figure's hand. I'm concerned about breaking the figure's thumb. Although I have seen some collectors put this in Firefly's hand, they are braver than I am. This is in the same green plastic as the submachine gun, and like the submachine gun, has a slight color variation. The final accessory is Firefly's backpack. The backpack is in gray plastic, the same gray color as the base plastic color on the figure, and it has some impressive details. It has some pouches, some explosives, and some gadgets. The backpack has a bonus feature. It has a removable panel, and on the back of that panel and on the inside of the backpack, there are some additional tools. This is a brilliant extra feature on the backpack. The card art makes it look like the opening panel is supposed to be hinged, but it is not. It's just removable. The pre-production drawings had the panel on a hinge, but that was cut before the final production. There is not enough space in the backpack for the walkie-talkie, and I think that's unfortunate. If the walkie-talkie were just a little smaller, and if the cavity in the backpack were just a little larger, these accessories would have worked together. Let's take a look at Firefly's articulation. He had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures by 1984, so he could turn his head from left to right. He could not look up and down. The ball-jointed head was not introduced until 1985. He could lift his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow that allowed him to bend his arm at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep that allowed his arm to be swiveled all the way around. This was an O-ring figure, meaning the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside. That allowed him to move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's take a look at the sculpt design and color of Firefly. This is one of only three G.I. Joe figures by 1984 with all-over camouflage. The other two were Stalker from 1982 and Ripcord from 1984. There were other figures with camouflage, but it didn't cover the whole figure like this. Gray is a dull color, especially considering how much color was introduced to the line by 1984. The uniform is perfect for Firefly's specialty, though. This is what I asked for, figures that look like they are designed for their specialty. His head is covered with a gray balaclava mask, and there is a dark gray camouflage pattern on that. His eyes are exposed with a Caucasian flesh tone. The chest is all gray with a dark gray camouflage pattern. He has a turtleneck collared undershirt and crossed bands across the chest and the back. And on the chest, those bands have grenades and pouches and what looks like sticks of dynamite. The chest details are impressive, but one thing that's odd is the camouflage goes right across the bands and the pouches and the grenades and everything that's on the back as well. Those details are not masked. On his arms, he has long gray sleeves with a dark gray camouflage pattern. He has a small knife on his right forearm. He has unidentified devices or pouches on his left forearm. He has dark gray gloves and on his upper right arm, he has a red cobra emblem. Firefly is a mercenary, yet he still has a cobra on his uniform, but he is not a cobra agent. I have to assume the designers thought without the cobra, there's nothing to indicate this is a bad guy, but... He looks like a bad guy. The waist piece is in a gray base plastic color with that dark gray camouflage pattern, and that camouflage goes right over the belt. He has some small pouches on the belt. His legs are gray with a dark gray camouflage pattern. On the right leg, he has a pistol in a holster with a strap that goes around the upper right leg. On the left leg, he has a couple devices, perhaps detonators for his explosives, and two straps that go around the left leg. Again, the camouflage pattern goes right over most of those details, they are not masked. We finish up with some dark gray boots with some straps around them. The dark gray appears to be the same color as the camouflage. The coloration on this figure is pretty simple, but appropriate. He has good details, but I would have preferred those details be masked off so the camouflage does not overlap them, or just paint those details in that dark gray color. Let's take a look at Firefly's file card. Say that five times fast. It has his faction as Cobra and a portrait of Firefly 
by here. He is the Obra Saboteur. The corner of my card is clipped off. His codename is Firefly. His file name is Classified, but I think we know what his real name is. Rufus T. Firefly. Uh, Rufus T. Firefly. His primary military specialty is Sabotage, Demolitions, and Terror. And with that many primary specialties, he doesn't need a secondary specialty. His birthplace is Classified. What is Firefly's birthplace? Some post-vintage sources say he is French. His prototype file card is ambiguous about his origins. He used aliases to serve in the French Foreign Legion Paris, the Biafra in Nigeria, and in Nicaragua. This paragraph says no one knows what Firefly's real name is or what he looks like. Well, in G.I. Joe Retaliation, he got his mask off quite a bit. He is known by his work, expert in all NATO and Warsaw Pact explosives and detonators, always places his charges in the one place that affords maximum damage. There is no question about his infiltration skills, since no one has ever reported seeing him enter or leave any target area. This bottom paragraph has a quote. It says, even Cobra Commander doesn't know much about Firefly. His fees are paid into a numbered Swiss bank account and are always payable in advance. He makes no guarantees and gives no refunds. The file card surrounds Firefly with an air of mystery. I mean, he could be a ninja with his infiltration skills. It doesn't say he's not a ninja. The comic book obliterates that mystery, and it isn't pretty. We need to talk about it. Let's look at how Firefly was used in G.I. Joe Media, and let's talk about the animated series before we get to the comic book. He first appeared in the miniseries Revenge of Cobra Part 1, but he had no lines. Most of his appearances are silent. He wasn't used very much in the animated series. He had the most exposure in the episode Ode to Cobra. Even that wasn't very much. He had a few post-vintage appearances, including in the miniseries G.I. Joe Resolute. His most notable post-vintage appearance was in the 2013 live-action movie G.I. Joe Retaliation, where he was played by Ray Stevenson. Oh, yes, they call him the street. No, Ray Stevenson. The real story of Firefly is in the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, and it is convoluted. He first appeared in issue number 24 on the very last page, where he is immediately captured by Zartan. In issue number 25, he provided Zartan with an opportunity to demonstrate his shape-shifting powers. In issue number 29, he and Destro managed to escape the Florida Swamp with a promise to exact vengeance upon Cobra Commander. He never really got that revenge. In fact, he became more into integrated into Cobra. In issue number 48, he was patrolling the streets of Springfield, Cobra's secret base. For the next few years, he had sporadic appearances. He appeared a few times in the G.I. Joe Special Missions series. He was in issue number one of Special Missions. He was rarely the focus of the story. We thought Firefly's story came to an end in issue number 98, in which Cobra Commander locked a lot of his enemies in a landlocked freighter and buried it under a volcano. Firefly was among them, and he was presumed Zoomed dead. In issue number 123, a new mysterious person was introduced, the leader of a group of red ninjas. In issue number 126, a familiar face was on the cover. The issue was titled Firefly, so you know where this is going. The red ninja leader's mask was covering another mask. He was secretly Firefly. Stop. How did Firefly escape the buried freighter? He programmed Cobra Bats to dig him out. He then pulled off his Firefly mask to reveal he was the Faceless Master. Apparently his face appears blurred because of hypnosis. Please stop! The Faceless Master was first introduced in a photograph in issue number 62. He was the assistant to the swordsmith Onehashi. But wait, this would have been confusing to readers at the time. Wasn't Onehashi's assistant Zartan? How could it be Firefly? Well, Larry Hama, the writer of the comic book, apparently picked up on this and added an explanation in the letters page of that issue. Almost the entire issue is Firefly providing exposition about his background, his motives, and where he's been since he apparently died. And yet even more exposition was needed on the letters page. I love the G.I. Joe comic book series, but this is rough. I believe this is caused by a disconnect between the toy designers, marketing, and the comic book creators. Larry had already killed off Firefly, but in the 90s somebody wanted to make a new Firefly figure. How do you reintegrate Firefly into the comic book series when he is dead? 
Not easily, apparently. The same thing happened with Dr. Mindbender. He was dead, but he had a new figure in the 90s, so he had to be brought back to life. This is one reason why the IDW comic book series is so valuable. It offers Larry Hama the opportunity to explore the story without the need to promote new toys very much. There are new figures and vehicles from time to time, but there's a lot more focus on the narrative and character development. I talked more about Firefly's comic book appearances in my review of versions 2 and 3, so I won't rehash any more of it here. We've done enough. Looking at Firefly overall, this is a great figure. Of course, I love it. Firefly is exactly the figure I would want it to be. He is a Cobra Saboteur, and he looks like it. He has a dark camouflage that is perfect for sneaking around urban areas at night. He is loaded with the tools of the trade. He has a backpack that opens up and contains tools and explosives. His submachine gun and walkie-talkie are cool, he would be effective on the battlefield or sneaking into G.I. Joe headquarters to set bombs. There are two minor problems with the figure. Though the camouflage is great, there's no mask for the equipment, so the camouflage goes right over the belts and the straps. That's a little weird. The other problem is with the walkie-talkie. It's a good-looking accessory, but there's nowhere to store it, so it's very easy to lose. This is Firefly as I would like to remember him. Gray and boring. Not as a ninja. He should not be a ninja. This is where there's a disconnect between the 80s and the 90s, and if we talk about Firefly, we can't avoid the subject. Sometimes it's good to expand a character that didn't have very much to do the first time around, but sometimes it would have been better to just leave the mystery. That was my review of Firefly. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please give this video a thumbs up on YouTube and subscribe to the YouTube channel for more G.I. Joe toy reviews and check out my huge back catalog of vintage G.I. Joe toy reviews. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. If you would like to know if I have reviewed a G.I. Joe toy, check out the website. The only way I can continue doing these videos is with the support of my friends on Patreon, and I'm very grateful. If you'd like to support the channel, that's a great way to do it. You see the name scrolling on the screen right now? Your name could be there. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. And next time, I think we're going to stay in the 80s, but we're going to jump from the early 80s to the late 80s. I'll see you then. And until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. But I think we know what his real name is. Well, yes, they call him the street. But I think we know what his real name is. Louis the Lightning Bug here.